Thank you. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here in Athens, and I am very proud of the alliance um, to which the minister has just referred between our institute in Manchester, the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation, and the Eugenides Foundation here in Athens. I believe that these sorts of alliances, perhaps is uh, a political word if I may say so, but these sorts of friendships uh, and contacts are hugely important. And I am delighted to be here and regard this meeting as I hope the first of many in which the friendship between our institutions will be further cemented. As the president of the Eugenides Foundation has just said, our children have to be better than us. And that is the theme of my talk this morning. I should also say that I, I shouldn't be here giving this talk. This uh, was a duty that fell to my friend and colleague, Professor Dan Brock of Harvard University, but unfortunately he was taken ill uh, just before this meeting. So I am very unworthily and inadequately stepping into his shoes. But uh, we all I know will wish Dan uh, a speedy recovery. He was taken ill in Geneva while uh, visiting and was unable to travel here to Athens. I wanted to start by taking up a theme that actually seems to be an unexpected theme of this conference. Uh, it was referred to by my colleague John Solston yesterday and has come up again this morning. And that is not just the theme of education, but the theme of the openness um, of our societies to ideas from everywhere, to international ideas. And I have just been reading a wonderful little book by Ernst Gombrich, a very famous art historian, called A Little History of the World. It is a book for school children, which he wrote uh, when he was a very career there. But I was struck, uh, literally a couple of days ago, by what he said about Athens. Now, he was referring to the Athens of Pericles, um, but I think it is not only apposite for that Athens, but our Athens, your Athens, uh, today, and it is certainly opposite for my talk. He was talking about those precious years around 444 BC when Pericles was the leading citizen, although not officially the ruler of this great city. And he was talking to children about why Athens flourished and indeed has handed down to us really what we now call Western civilization. And Having explained some of the things, he addresses the children and he says, but I hear you asking me, what exactly did they, these Athenians, do that was so great? And he responds, I can only say everything. They did everything that was so great. Now, I believe that this is a moment where we, their intellectual descendants, we, the current citizens of Europe, the current citizens of the world, are at a moment where we have to do not everything perhaps, but a great many things that are great if we are to survive. And that is my theme. Because there is no point in greening humanity if there will be no humanity to green. So my theme for this brief talk is the survival of humanity in one form or another is the question, has humankind a future? Now, many of our current thinkers think not, think that humanity probably does not have a future, at least not unless we change radically. Doomsday scenarios forecasting either the end of the world or the end of humanity, are increasingly to be found even from the most respectable of scientists. I have been collecting examples, but I will give just one this morning. Um, Martin Rees, uh, the Astronomer Royal in the United Kingdom and outgoing president of the Royal Society, in a book written or published in 2004, which, which, which was called Our Final Century. 
and imagines indeed that this century might be the final century of humankind. And I want to quote from Martin Rees's book. We are entering an era when a single person can by one clandestine act cause millions of deaths and when a malfunction in cyberspace can cause havoc worldwide. And Rees also goes on to give many other examples, including the possibility of asteroid strikes that might indeed destroy the world. Now, to combat these and other disasters, we may need not only to have children who are better than us, but indeed who ha to have children that are significantly different from us. We may need to try not just to use the conventional means that the minister has just referred to, education, to make our children smarter than us, but we may need to use science for that purpose as well. We may need to make our children more able to combat or to think of countermeasures to the disasters that face us, or indeed we may need to make our descendants more resilient, more resistant, for example, to new diseases than they have been up to now. And of course we are very familiar with the constant appearance of new diseases, whether HIV, AIDS or CJD or many others. Or we may need to further adapt the world to changing circumstances. Now, by a lucky accident, I can claim to be one of the visionaries of greening humanity, because in a book I published in 1992 called Wonder Woman and Superman, I imagined, admittedly not for purposes of this meeting, but I imagined a scenario in which the world was literally greened. The scenario I imagined was this, that suppose due to further depletions in the ozone layer, depletions that are now being uh, remedied, thank goodness, but at that time was a very uh, important uh, worry, suppose that due to things like that, we humans had become much more vulnerable to radiation from the sun and the consequent cancers were becoming virulent. And suppose the only way to combat this danger was to change skin pigmentation among human beings, to turn our skins literally green, possibly also with the added bonus that we might benefit from photosynthesis, a rather fanciful idea. Uh, would we have reasons to oppose this sort of change? And I chose green because I thought under normal circumstances, it would be a wickedness and a cruelty for parents deliberately to create children with green skin because they would be ostracized by their fellows and have a miserable life. But in the face of an important reason, a survival reason to do this, it might seem not only uh, not wicked and stupid, but actually morally, ethically imperative to do such a thing. So I use that example simply as a way of trying to get us to think about really radical change in the service of survival, a change that would literally change human beings as we had hitherto known them. In the face of other threats of the sort predicted by recent others, many radical but perhaps less visible changes to humankind might become necessary. And in the rest of my presentation, which I will try to keep brief because I know that we're already running a little bit behind time, uh, I wish to look objectively, I hope, at other real possibilities for what is now being called human enhancement, radical changes to human nature that actually might result in human beings eventually uh, further evolving into a new species, not by the continued operation of Darwinian evolution, but by deliberately engineered, uh, what I've called enhancement evolution, deliberately engineered changes into human nature. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if we humans could live longer, healthier lives with immunity to many of the diseases like cancer or AIDS that currently beset us? Even more wonderful might be the possibility of increased mental powers, powers of memory, reasoning, concentration, or the possibility of increased physical powers, strength, stamina, endurance, speed of reaction, and the like. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Well, many people think not. The idea of improving on human nature has been widely rejected. Decisive interventions in the natural lottery of life to enhance human performance, improve life, and perhaps thereby irrevocably change human nature, or indeed our genetic constitution, have met with extreme hostility. But whatever people say, no one, I believe, actually thinks that there is anything in principle wrong with the enhancement of human beings. This seeming contradiction, paradoxical as it may be, is resolved when we reflect on the familiarity and acceptability of enhancing technologies and their long and successful history. Many of us are already enhanced, even you and me. Do you use this enhancement technology? I do. It's a wonderful enhancement technology and it enables me to glance down at my notes and actually read them. <coughs> have you been immunized? Have you been vaccinated? Yes, you probably have. And even if you haven't, you will have benefited from the so-called herd immunity created by the fact that others have been vaccinated. Not only do we all approve of enhancement, we approve of it for good reason. We approve because we are decent, moral people who want to protect each other from harm and who want to benefit ourselves and our societies and our descendants. In terms of human functioning, an enhancement is by definition an improvement on what went before. If it wasn't good for you, it wouldn't be an enhancement. We have reasons for declining to create or confer on other people even trivial harms. And we have moral reasons to confer and not withhold even small benefits. The freedom of citizens to do what's right ethically, and indeed what we now realize might in fact preserve life on this planet, and also what is personally prudent, is not only self-evidently sensible, it is, as I shall argue, enshrined in our moral and in our political theory. Threats to human life and dramatic policies and practices to meet them are all too frequent in human history. And I want to recount to you my own, as it were, initiation into concern um, not only about the dangers to humankind, but indeed concern about the real possibility of human enhancement. In 1961, the philosopher Bertrand Russell published a book. It was actually a, a political pamphlet. People forget that the eminent uh, English philosopher was a great pamphleteer and proselytizer. And he published a little book called Has Man a Future? in which that question was taken seriously. And this book influenced me greatly. I was in 1961 at school, but I had become very worried about the nuclear arms race and had joined what is now sometimes called the peace movement, but what was then the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And this book was one that influenced me greatly. And in that book, Russell imagines being called before God. Now, Russell was an atheist, but it's a vivid example um, of being called to account for our contribution to the success or failure of the world. He imagines being called before God. The God he imagines addressing him is Osiris, and he's asked by that God why the human race deserves to continue. And this is the conversation that Russell imagines. <clears throat> 